This podcast is brought to you from our friends at Tincata Protective Fabrics, Emergency Networking, Magna Grip, and IFSTA. Hey everybody, it's Eric Dryman uh, from Hooks and, from the Hooks and Hoses podcast. Uh, welcome to uh, welcome to the latest edition of the podcast this evening. Uh, get some things out of the way, some announcements and uh, recognitions and things um, before we get going with tonight's uh, program. Uh, first and foremost, please, if you're uh, listening to this on YouTube, uh, one of the platforms, uh, podcast platforms, please uh, like it. Uh, it just helps um, helps us with our uh, content uh, ratings and things. So uh, we really appreciate it if you give us a thumbs up or a five star review or um, whatever you feel is appropriate. Uh, another thing, FDIC 2024, it's going to be here before you know it. We just had our first uh, instructors, hot instructor organizational meeting uh, a week ago yesterday. Um, and uh, we found out that we're already ahead of schedule for enrollment for the hot classes. So um, if you're interested in taking a hot class this year at FDIC or next year at FDIC 2024, I would recommend that you get yourself registered for those classes or um, get with your department's um, training pr uh, officer and make those arrangements to get, get yourself and your fellow firefighters registered because all indications are that uh, based upon what the numbers were already this year that um, we're probably going to sell out in 2024. So you don't want to wait until till after the first of the year and then end up not getting the classes that you want. We were 20% ahead of where we were this time last year already when we, um, when we met um, last week. So uh, it's definitely going to be a big conference um, based upon everything that we're hearing. Um, it could, could set a record for attendance in 2024. So, uh, hopefully we've got all the slow years and the sickness and, and everything else. I don't even want to say the big C word because um, I'm tired of dealing with it. But hopefully we've got all that behind us and FDIC is going to be back bigger and stronger and better than ever starting in uh, 2024. So uh, some more FDIC or fire engineering news that is. Um, we recorded. We were fortunate enough, um, thanks to uh, Chief Bobby Halton, who got this whole process started for me and Dave Rhodes picked up the uh, the torch and carried it along along with uh, Diane Rothschild. Uh, we recorded a series of training minutes um, back in April at FDIC. So those training minutes, uh, the first episode of the training minutes came out today. So um, check those out on uh, the fire engineering website. Uh, we did six of them, I believe, and uh, they'll be coming out every few weeks for the next uh, handful of months. So uh, plenty of uh, topics or talks about then inner search uh, in those training minutes. So, uh, and then the last thing I want to mention, um, today's October the 17th. We're recording this episode that will air next Friday. Um, on this date, back in 1966, uh, the New York City Fire Department up to that date suffered their greatest loss of life in a single day. And that was at the uh, 23rd Street Fire. Uh, the firefighters were operating in a, um, had a fire in an art dealership. Uh, the basement of an art dealership. Uh, they couldn't get to the fire because of the intensity of it. So they went next door to a drug store. I believe it was Wonder Drugs, um, which had which shared a common basement uh, with the art store. Uh, firefighters were making their way into the uh, art store uh, to try and get down into the basement, locate the fire and extinguish it, and the floor collapsed. Ten firefighters fell directly into the basement uh, all of whom died as a result of uh, the heat and their injuries and everything else. And then two more firefighters were also killed at that fire. They were caught in a flashover and, um, and perished as well. So a total of 12 firefighters at one fire, uh, October the 17th, 1966. Uh, we oftentimes think, well, that was so long ago. You know, it was almost 60 years ago. You know, if we do think so much differently now. There's not anything to learn, um, you know, you know, we, we just are different now, right? Well, I can tell you that if you read the story of those guys, um, if you've ever fought a basement fire or you've ever crawled in on the first floor knowing you're going to a basement fire, we're still doing that stuff today. So if you get the opportunity, um, if not, when you get done with this podcast at some point in the future, just look that up. It's on the 
on the internet. You, there's plenty of articles about it, about what happened, um, what they learned from it, all those sorts of things. So uh, I just didn't want to go with today being the anniversary of the, uh, of the fire, not, um, not mentioning it uh, as part of the podcast. So um, <clears throat> tonight we're going to talk about um, fire ground operations, fire ground efficiencies. How do we make ourselves um, better at doing our job? At fires, and, I'm, and the emphasis is on fires here tonight. Um, but you, but this translates across to everything, whether it's a medical run, whether it's an extrication run, a rope rescue, water rescue, um, you know, vehicle, you know, vehicle fire on the interstate. It could be anything. But these skills, these ideas, translate across all those different disciplines. Although we're going to kind of focus on on the firefighting aspect of it tonight, but. Um, we talk about effective. Are we effective and are we being efficient? You know, we need both of those, right? Um, we have to be effective, but we also have to be efficient. Um, and we're going to kind of focus on efficiency tonight, but um, the basic definition of effic efficiency is the condition or fact of producing the results you want without waste of time, effort, or material. So we want to get things done as quickly as we can, expending the least amount of energy, using the least amount of equipment, um, and doing it in the uh, least amount of time. So, you know, pretty straightforward definition, nothing too fancy about that. Um, but but when we when we start to dissect that and break that down, it, it starts to take on a little bit more complex of a meaning and, and all the different aspects and facets of it about how we maintain our, one, we get our efficiency, and then after we get our efficiency, how do we maintain it? So um, I use the word peak, you know, we, we like our acronyms in the fire service, but uh, the letters of PEAK, P-E-A-K, all stand for a different word. Um, the P stands for prepare or practice, kind of interchangeable. Uh, the E is our equipment. Um, the A is assignments. And then the K is knowing. So we'll, we're going to kind of get into those a little bit. And then there's some tenants that go along with it um, that we'll, we'll discuss individually as well. So when we pr prepare or practice, um, the things we want to do or we want to know how we do it. So we want to know how to use a piece of equipment, how to use a ladder, how to use a saw, you know, how to use a defibrillator, whatever we're talking about. Um, but not only do we have to know how to use it, but we know, need to know why to use it. You know, why are we using a two and a half instead of an inch and three quarter? Or why are we using a 28 instead of a, of a 20 foot straight? Or, you know, you pick the um, equipment and we could have those debates, but you need to know the why. It's not just an, it's not enough to know how to use something, but you have to know how to apply it and, and why. And then lastly, when, you know, when does it make sense to pull an inch to three quarter instead of a two and a half? Or, you know, when does it make sense to use a rotary saw on a roof instead of a chainsaw? Things like that. So just in the practice and prepare part, you know, there's a lot that goes into that. Right. We say practice and train and all that, but it's not just about the skill and being able to perform the skill. It's being able to apply and think and and. Uh, understand why you're doing the skill and then how to do it and uh, and then when to use it next is your equipment uh, you know we i hope that every one of you that's listening to this or watching this on um on, on your computer has all the equipment in the world that you want but my guess is you probably don't um you know our departments do a pretty good job for the most part i know some departments have more challenges with budgets than others but I'm going to I'm going to say as a as a general rule, most departments have at least the minimum basic basic equipment that they need to do their job. They have hose, they have ladders, they have saws, hair packs, thermal imaging cameras, um, you know, those those sorts of basic um, pieces of equipment that I'm talking about. But, um, you know, you have to make sure that that equipment is maintained and that you know how to use that equipment. It's great to have have a. 750 or million dollar piece of fire apparatus sitting in your bay with with another half a million dollars worth of equipment on it but if you don't know exactly how to use it all and when to use it and why to use it um then then it's kind of the purpose and it's kind of pointless to have all that equipment so it's important for us to make sure that we stay up on that stuff some of some of the equipment we use a lot and we're very proficient at it we're very familiar with it other pieces of equipment we may only get off every once in a while like say uh Maybe you've got a foam adductor on your um, on your apparatus or you carry meters for hazmat runs or something like that, that you carry it. It's, it's an important piece of equipment, but it's not something that you use on a regular basis like you might um, hose or ladders or, you know, things like that. Seconds count when responding to an emergency. 
minute save count when documenting your day. Emergency networking makes records management easier and faster with its Fire and EMS solution. User-friendly, complete online and offline functionality, highly customizable, all at an affordable price. For more information, please visit emergencynetworking.com. So it's important that we stay up on that equipment. Another thing that we need to know is where that equipment is at, uh, particularly if you're a roving firefighter or you're going to a different station for a shift or you're working overtime somewhere. We need to know where our equipment is so that when we get to the scene, we don't look like a fool running around opening and closing compartments looking for what we're uh, what we're trying to find. And then the last thing about our equipment is how many people does it take to operate that equipment? If we've got a piece of equipment that, on our apparatus that, don't, that takes three people to operate uh, because of its weight or its complexity or, or whatever it might be, if we're running with two or three people on our apparatus, we're, we're going to very quickly exhaust our personnel that we have available to do anything else. It's going to take everybody just to op- potentially operate one piece of equipment and then we've got nobody left over to to do anything else. So got to kind of take all those things into consideration when we're talking about equipment. Um, next thing is assignments. This one I'm kind of big on. Um, primarily the reason I'm big on it is because I've seen how well it works uh, in my department and in other departments that um, that I travel to and train with and um, have had opportunities to, to work around. And that is um, having predetermined assignments based upon where you arrive. If you're the first engine, you have a job and that's written down somewhere in a policies and procedures manual or standard operating guidelines that says at a residential fire, the first engine's responsibility is this, or at an apartment fire with a standpipe, the first two engines' responsibilities are this. And they're pretty basic, straightforward. They're not written in stone. There's certainly room for flexibility, but having those predetermined assignments, um, makes a huge difference because it, it allows you, whether you're the company officer, you're the engineer, or you're the firefighter, or even a chief officer for that matter, um, if I know that engine one is going to be the first engine, or I know that engine three is going to be the second engine, and we have all that written out, what the first engine, second engine, first ladder, whatever it might be, is supposed to do when they arrive on the scene, unless unless I need them to do something outside of those standard written guidelines that we've predetermined, I as the incident commander or I as the company officer don't really have to do a lot of extra thinking or a lot of extra uh, talking on the radio. Everything falls into place on its own. And what that does is it allows you as you're responding in, if you're on an engine and you you think based upon where the other apparatus that are responding to this address are coming from, you're going to have a, probably a pretty good idea of whether you're going to be first, second, or third. And if we'll say, for example, that you're the second engine and you know in your guidelines, the second engine's responsibility is to to establish a water supply for the first engine. So you can start thinking, hey, we're going to establish a water supply. So, you know, if you've got hydrants, you know, as the company officer going in or as the engineer driving the apparatus, you can be looking for those hydrants as you approach the address. And the people in the back, if you've got more than one firefighter in the back, they can decide, hey, you know, who's going to get the hydrant and what size hose are you going to lay out, you know, based upon the building construction or the type of response you're responding to, those sorts of things. So you can have all those conversations or have all those thoughts running through your head before you ever pull the emergency brake and have to hop off the apparatus and hook up to that hydrant. So, again, it just makes things a lot easier. Having pre- having assignments in your apparatus also is a big help. Uh, I know from, say, for a uh, for a truck company, for example, if I'm sitting in a seat uh, and I have maybe I've taken little laminated sheets of paper and I've, I've taped them to the or maybe I've made plaques and put magnetic or magnetized them onto the side of the chair, that that uh, seat. And it says, hey, if you're sitting here, your job is to grab the irons and the hydro ram if we're, you're the first truck or if we're the second ladder, your job is to grab a uh, 20 foot straight and the chainsaw or whatever, you know, and, and based upon where you're sitting, those are the tools that you grab. Now, if you work in a career department where you um, sit in the same seat day in and day out, or even if you rotate seats, um, it makes it a little easier for you than it does for folks that are working in uh, combination or volunteer departments 
but you can still have those um, tool assignments or task assignments based upon where you're sitting in the apparatus. But you have to have those conversations ahead of time and establish those those expectations and those rules ahead of time. Otherwise, um, when you're going down the road, it's kind of a little bit too late. IFSTA is dedicated to updating firefighting techniques and safety through the creation of our manuals, apps, curriculum, resource one, and more. Our high quality, technically accurate, and affordable training and education materials have made us a worldwide leader of the fire service. Visit us at ifsta.org for more information. But I can speak from personal experience, having those writing assignments ahead of time again, makes it so much easier because one, it cuts down on the confusion and the, the questioning that the firefighters might do because they already know what they're supposed to grab when they get to the scene uh, based upon where they're sitting and, and the conversations we've already had prior to the run coming in. Um, the other thing it does is uh, it, if everybody grabs what they're supposed to based upon their writing assignment, then when it's time for us to do our job, when we get to the front door of the house or we get to the roof, we've got all the equipment that we're supposed to have. Nothing got left behind. Nothing got forgot. Um, got all the equipment that you need. And it took very little effort on your part when you were rolling down the street responding to the incident. Uh, the last letter in the peak is no. Um, the firefighters and company officers um, need to know your limits, need to know your capabilities not only physically and mentally, but also um, your proficiency with equipment. You know, if you're not familiar with how to use something, then that's something that you need to work on so that if you get asked to use it or you get told to go do a job that requires a certain piece of equipment that you're not as familiar with, that you're capable of um, accomplishing that job. The other thing that's important, for, particularly for company officers and, and chief officers who may find themselves in the role of incident commander, is you have to know the limitations of the people you have available to you. If you're working in an organization where you, you may only have six to 10 people that show up at a residential fire response, um, it's going to be really hard for you to have a backup line, an attack line, um, you know, a search team, a vent team, an exposure line, uh, an OV crew. Um, you're, you're not going to be able to accomplish all those tasks. So you have to prioritize, hey, based upon the number of people that I have here, what are my priorities? What do, what are my firefighters capable of accomplishing before either one, they need to get fresh bottles or they're so gassed that they need to go to rehab? Because at the end of the day, we've got to stabilize the incident, uh, regardless of how many people we have there. Uh, so it's important to know what our personal limitations are, as well as the limitations of the people that we're supervising. And that's going to go a long way towards not only keeping yourself safe or your people safe, but also to getting the most done, basically the most bang for your buck uh, with the amount of people um, and equipment that you have available at your disposal. So I mentioned earlier we were going to go over some tenants, and there's six fire ground tenants. Uh, some of these I may have mentioned before. I, I rely upon these a lot um, when I'm talking about uh, operating on a fire ground because I really, I really believe that they're important. I really have bought into them. Um, and I, I, you know, to say that you can boil a fire ground down into six um, ideas or six concepts um, is probably a bit brash. But I think that if you take these six tenets to heart or you think about these six things that we're going to talk about um, and dwell on them a little bit, I think you'll you'll see that for the most part, um, the vast majority of at least your routine day to day fires, whether they be residential a garden apartment, you know, a, a small business occupancy type fire that, that you can um, handle with first alarm companies. Um, I think these tenants are going to hold true. And, and I would argue that, that they hold true even for, for more substantial incidents, but certainly for your more day-to-day -day routine type of incidents. Um, to me, I, I feel that these are, uh, are very important and, and worth talking about. So tenant one, company officers. Um, company officers, in my opinion, are the backbone of the fire department. And, and we can have a debate about whether it's the firefighters that get the work done or it's the chiefs that make all the decisions. And we can have those discussions and, and, and debates. But in my opinion, it's the company officers um, who, are the, who are the backbone of, 
of what happens at an emergency scene. And the reason that I say that is because the company officer in, in most organizations, um, because of staffing, not only has to be in charge of other firefighters and keep them safe, but typically they're, they're responsible for also performing some sort of uh, physical task. So they have to be able to think on their feet and prioritize tasks um, that, that have to be accomplished. They need to be able to adapt uh, to what they're presented with. And then they must also be able to physically perform um, on the fire ground while keeping, um, you know, one eye open for whatever might reach out and uh, bite them or their firefighters and get themselves in trouble. So like a trusted turnout jacket you've had for years, Flex 7 outer shell fabric delivers a perfectly broken in feel on the very first wear. Flexible, comfortable, and powered with the strength of enforced technology, Flex 7 outer shell fabric is made to move. To learn more, visit tenkatafabrics.com slash Flex 7. Flex 7, powered by enforced technology, only from Tenkata Protective Fabrics. Um, they have to be capable of multitasking, although some people will say, well, multitasking is not really possible um, based upon the way our brain works. But that's, a, that's another conversation for a different day. But um, in general, they just need to be able to, to do a lot of different things at the same time. And, and that's why I feel like um, the, the company officer really is the, um, the linchpin and all of that. Uh, and making sure that everything's getting done um, at an emergency scene, whether it's a fire or, or some other type of incident. Uh, the second uh, <clears throat> rule or tenet is nothing should deter from stretching and operating the first hand line uh, to, to put water on the fire. And I've seen it. I'm sure you all have probably seen it where uh, two engine companies are racing uh, one another across the front yard or, um, you know, up a stairwell or whatever the case might be, because they want to be the engine company that that gets to uh, to put the fire out. And you know, back in the 17, 1800s, when uh, insurance companies used to pay the volunteer fire department that uh, put the fire out, um, you know, I don't agree with it now, and I certainly wouldn't have agreed with it then. But um, but there was, you know whether you agree with it or not, there was a basis for why they were fighting each other to put water on the fire. But in today's modern fire service, there's, there should be no, um, there, there should never be two engine companies, uh, both competing side by side to get, get the first line in operation. What should be happening is, um, if the first engine company struggling, getting their line in operation because of kinks or turns or, um, access issues or whatever the case might be, then it should be incumbent upon everybody else that's there on the fire ground that can help to help that first engine company get that line in operation. Uh, you know, some departments will actually pair engine companies up, particularly when you get into a, um, a mid rise or a high rise firefighting situation, um, simply because of the, the challenges and using larger diameter, you know, two and a half inch hand lines, uh, to fight fires, standpipe operations, or a building that has no standpipes, but maybe you need to get water up to the fourth or fifth floor, um, is normally going to require more than one engine company to do. So it only makes sense that you double up the number of people to help get that hand line in place as quickly as possible. And, uh, you know, I'm beating up on my engine company, uh, on the engine company firefighters here, uh, a little bit, um, you know, talking about competing and battling hose lines and dueling hand lines and all that sort of stuff. And I've seen that stuff happen and I know it happens, but it's also incumbent on everybody else. And I don't care whether you're on a ladder company, you're on an ambulance, you're on a uh, two man, you know, QR, quick response vehicle that uh, has firefighters on it, whatever the case might be. Um, you know, if you're, you see an engine company struggling with getting their hand line, uh, stretched or it gets kinked or it gets wrapped wrapped underneath a door or, or something um you know a bookshelf falls over on it and now it's pinned to the floor things like that happen it's incumbent upon you to take the time just take 10 seconds and help them out because we all know that if uh, the faster the fire goes out the quicker everything else typically gets better um, so it's important to understand that particularly with with the way our fires burn now 
we know that with the flow path stuff and and uh, the BTUs that are being produced by the man-made materials that are burning these days, the amount of smoke that gets produced and how toxic it is, the quicker we can stop all that from happening by putting the fire out, the better off it's going to be for, first and foremost, any fire victims that are inside. Um, but it's also going to minimize the amount of property damage that's done uh, to the contents of the uh, structure as well as the structure itself. And lastly, it also makes it safer for us um, because we don't have to worry about fire extending or fire getting behind us or, um, you know, fire burning through a floor or something like that could end, that can end up uh, getting us jammed up and, and causing us problems. So getting that first hand line in, in operation is paramount. The only thing I'll, I'll take back um, one thing, and I will say the only thing that, that would preclude that would be if you're trying to get the hand line in operation and you've got somebody that's obviously in immediate need of rescue. And I would, that would, I would say that that would be the only exception to the rule um, would be that if you, that you would forego getting that first hand line in operation, if you had to make an immediate rescue because somebody's hanging out a window and they got fire blowing over their head or, you know, something pretty dire, but in most, most circumstances getting that first line in, and operation is, is the most important thing. Breathing in diesel exhaust fumes is like walking into a fire without a mask. Over time, those toxins lead to cancer. Protect yourself with MagnaGrip, the easiest, most reliable exhaust removal system that features a true 100% seal to eliminate diesel exhaust fumes. To get free grant assistance, visit MagnaGrip.com. The fifth rule is the most efficient and effective fire attack occurs when firefighters are assigned to perform specific engine and truck company operations at the same time. So, again, this gets down to staffing, but it also gets down to roles and responsibilities and, and kind of reverts back to those predetermined uh, assignments based upon your order of arrival. And knowing that, um, you know, there's certain things that need to be done at every fire. We need to put we need to stretch hand lines because we've got to spray water. We need to do a search for fire victims. We need to ventilate. Um, all those things, you know, at a minimum, those three things need to be done. And that's if we don't have to worry about forcible entry or softening the building because it's got burglar bars or ladder in the second floor for a VES or anything like that. Just talking straightforward, boilerplate, um, bread and butter job where you've, you know, single family residence, 1,500 square feet, um, that sort of thing. But at a minimum, we got to get those three things done attack, search, and ventilation. Uh, and, and ideally, we're going to perform those all at the same time. Um, for Depending upon your staffing, you know, that could be easier said than done. But but hopefully, you know, you could pull off those three things with five firefighters, six firefighters, if you absolutely had to. It wouldn't be ideal. wouldn't be the way I'd want to do it. wouldn't be the way that I do it. Um, here in Indianapolis, where we work, we're very fortunate. Um, but... But at a minimum, you need about, you know, half a dozen people to pull that off. Um, but you need to be able to do those things simultaneously, if possible. Get your engine truck and your truck work done, or engine, oper engine operations and your truck operations done at the same time. It just makes things much better on the fire ground, other than just worrying about putting water on the fire and not um, providing ventilation or not performing the search until the fire's out or searching, but not putting the fire out, things like that. Um, as a general rule, those are the kinds of things that, that we want to try and accomplish. Um, you know, many of you I know are operating in circumstances where you have low staffing. Um, I would say that if you think that you've got a working incident or as soon as you know you've got a working incident, if you think you need more people, then you, then you probably need twice as many as you think you're going to because you're already kind of behind the eight ball, you're behind the curve at that point. So call for more assistance. I know a lot of you, it's coming from 10, 15 minutes away or more maybe, but it's rather to get them, I'd rather get them going and then turn out, turn around and not need them. Then all of a sudden you need them and now you got to wait 10 or 15, 20 minutes for them to get there. So, um, you know, for, for those of you who aren't as fortunate as others to have the good staffing, if you think you need people, then you probably do. So get them going and uh, get them to the scene. Um, 
Nothing saves more lives on the fire ground than a properly placed hand line. Again, the fire, if the fire goes out, then we've made everybody else's job a whole lot easier. Uh, we know that when we when we put water on the fire, some of the things that happen are pretty straightforward. It gets cooler. You know, we, we're knocking the, the, the BTU production, that heat production, out of the fire because we're extinguishing it. But the other thing that happens is that fire stops producing all those noxious gases. Uh, and then the third third most straightforward thing that it does is all those hot gases that were being pushed out away from the seat of that fire because we know that, uh, you know, to get get into a quick physics lesson here, um, things always move from a state of high pressure or an area of high pressure to an area of low pressure. So where the heat is, that's high pressure. And where the cooler area is outside, that's low pressure. So all that heat and stuff's trying to get to where it's cooler. If we cool that environment, all those hot gases that were rapidly expanding suddenly contract. And when they contract, they start to change that high pressure, low pressure differential. And it actually helps to draw fresh air back into the building, which, you know, is going to certainly help our victims uh, because now we're providing them with cleaner air that isn't contaminated with all that smoke and all those um toxic chemicals that the smoke has in it nowadays but it's also going to cool the environment which is going to make it better for our victims it's going to make it better for us as firefighters um, it's going to help improve our visibility and it's going to help us to accomplish our job much faster uh, so that we're not so exhausted we're not uh, getting ourselves jammed up because we can't see what we're doing um, and we're not overextending ourselves um, you know, trying to do our job because of the visibility and the high heat and those sorts of things. So, you know, even if we need, if we know we're going to need multiple hand lines, if we've got a fire that's deep seated or it's taken over a good portion of the, of the structure, um, it's still imperative to get that first hand line moving some water in the right direction before we focus on getting additional hand lines um, stretched and operating there. You know, if, even if we, all we do with that first hand line, is basically prevent that fire from extending any further. We're basically putting that hand line up as a as a shield or a, a block to that fire to minimize its ability to spread any further. If we can keep that fire in check until additional hand lines are able to be charged and put into operation, then we can save potentially more victims that aren't in that involved area. And certainly we can save, you know, at least a portion of the structure that might otherwise be lost if we had two or three different companies trying to stretch their lines simultaneously all the while the, the structure is burning down rather than focusing on getting that first hand line uh, in operation. So again, it just goes back to the importance of that first hand line um, that I talked about earlier. Um, rule five or tenant five is um, having proper staffing training equipment and strong officers provides the greatest opportunity to, to successfully use the risk versus benefit or risk versus reward um, concept. So, you know, it's, we, we can risk a lot to save a lot, risk a little to save a little and all that sort of stuff that we've all heard before. But if we don't have the right people, the right training, the right equipment and good officers, then it's gonna make it hard for us to make a conscious, legitimate, um, honest, risk versus benefits analysis or, you know, create an incident action plan. If you want to talk a little bit more, you know, you want to get NIMSI and, and more incident command related and talk about your IAP um, and those sorts of things. Um, because believe it or not, every fire we have an IAP, um, most of them aren't written down, but we have, you know, an incident action plan that we um, execute at every fire. We know the fire needs to be extinguished. We need to know, we know we need to search for victims we need to know we need to ventilate. Um, you know, that's your incident action plan, whether it was written down or not. And that's your risks, risk versus benefits um, evaluation that you're doing. You know, where is it safe to operate? What risk am I willing to take? What risk am I willing to put uh, the people under my charge? Um, and, you know, what risk am I willing for them to take based upon the reward for the return on the investment. So if we're just there to try and save a building, uh, 
my risk tolerance is not going to be as high as it is if I know I've got somebody that we know is trapped inside or potentially trapped inside that requires us to go inside and, and do a search. Um, but it's hard to, to make legitimate estimations on those things if we don't have well-trained people with the proper equipment and the proper number of personnel to accomplish whatever needs to be done. Um, we know firefighting is always going to be dangerous. Um, you know, our goal is, is to make it as safe as we can. But at the end of the day, I think everybody that took this job or volunteers to do this job knew that they weren't, they weren't signing up to go sit behind a desk and type on a computer all day. We know that there are certain, there's a certain amount of risk associated with this job and it comes with the territory. Um, now there's no, there's, there's no, no requirement that you operate with reckless abandon or freelance or do stupid stuff, which I've uh, been witness to and probably uh, pulled off at one point or another in my career because I was a young firefighter who thought I, who thought they knew it all at one point too. But, um, you know, that's, that's where that education and, and proper training and all that sort of stuff comes into play. Uh, particularly the more time you have on the job, uh, whether you're an officer or not, the better, cap the more capable you are of making those risk versus benefits, um, you know, assessments. So it's important to understand that and know that those things have to be done. We can't just go in, um, you know, hard charging all the time without stopping and thinking a little bit, maybe take a deep breath as you're pulling up and the engineers setting the emergency brake and you're taking everything in briefly. Uh, to get your head around it before you step off the apparatus and you uh, you go to work. Uh, taking a few seconds uh, while you're getting ready to go to work can pay off huge dividends on the back end because you may see something that you might have missed if you just pulled up and immediately jumped out and rushed headlong into the incident um, that might end up turning around and, and biting you in the butt. So um, having that time, having that um, experience is very important. The last tenant is um, tenant number six or rule number six. Um, there's only two things that that really make a difference on a fire ground that the fire department does, and that's the application of water and that's ventilation. Um, if we ventilate but we don't put water on the fire, what happens? I think we'd all agree that the fire is going to get bigger. Um, if we put water on the fire, but we don't ventilate, what happens? Well, we potentially steam ourselves, we steam our victims. Um, the water that expands, um, it might displace the smoke. Um, but depending upon how much water we flow and how, how much it expanded, it could actually push some of the fresh air out along with, with the bad, bad air because of all that steam expansion. So, uh, we know that we put water on the fire. Um, we're cooling the atmosphere, which is important for our victims and for us uh, from an operational standpoint. We know that's important. But we can also cool the environment if we coordinate our ventilation with our fire attack. Uh, and we can accomplish that either through horizontal ventilation, which is the, certainly the easiest to accomplish, but we can do it also with vertical ventilation. And in some cases, in my opinion, vertical ventilation can be even more drastic and more um, more important than horizontal, but it takes more people and it takes more uh, training and experience and equipment to pull off. So I understand that depending upon your staffing uh, and your experience levels and your equipment availability, you know, some things are not equal across the board for all organizations. But regardless of whether you perform horizontal ventilation or you perform vertical ventilation, it's important to coordinate those with the attack crew. Uh, I've, I've seen videos of firefighters who thought, you know, they had a, a pike pole in their hand or they had an ax in their hand. Therefore, they had to go around and break out every window uh, that they came across, which, you know, for the untrained firefighter, an you know, experienced firefighter, that's what they're supposed to do. They're supposed to let the smoke out, right? Because if you break the windows, um, we let all the bad smoke out. Right. But those of us that have been around a while, um, been to some fires, had some experience, did some studying on our own, know that when all that bad air is going out, we're bringing fresh air in. 
and all that fresh air is going to do is, as we know, is feed the fire. So um, that's why I say it's important to coordinate. You know, if you've got a, uh, if you can identify from the outside where the um, seat of the fire is, or maybe you don't know exactly where it is, but you know which end of the house it's on, um, and you're going to try and provide some horizontal ventilation to um, for the attack crew when they get inside and start flowing water. You need to wait until you hear them flowing water before you take the window. Don't take it before they're there and ready to go. Um, I've seen that happen prematurely. I've seen crews that were going in. Uh, suddenly their pump operator loses water for some reason or a length of hose bursts or they're crawling in and suddenly they, they encounter hoarding conditions and they, they made it in the front door and maybe 10 or 15 feet inside the front door but they can't actually get to the back of the structure where the fire's burning, but somebody's already taken the glass out. And now we've got a situation where we've got a fire that's being fed all the fresh air that it wants, and there's no way to get any water on it. So please, please, if you're going to horizontally ventilate, coordinate that with the attack crew. You know, the you, you hear people talk about, well, you know, the attack crew should hit the horizontal uh, vent crew on the radio and say, okay, we're getting ready to apply water. Go ahead and take the windows. Uh, well, if you take, if you can stop and think to do that, then more power to you. But I've seen more times than not, it's just as easy for the horizontal firefighter to just wait and listen for when the when they start to hear the water flow, and then take the windows. If the engine officer has the wherewithal to stop and actually radio out and say take the windows, then more power to them. But in my experience, um, that sounds good in training. That sounds good. Um, in theory, but it just doesn't happen at most inst uh, most incidents that I've been to. So um, coordinate that with the attack crew, however you do it. If you're going to the roof, normally as a general rule, unless there's a lot of um, debris or, or uh, you know, an extremely hot fire that um, it's going to require more than one hand line to knock down, most of the time the, the attack crew is going to be near the sea of the fire or at the sea of the fire and applying water by the time you can assemble a crew and get to the roof and get the roof opened up and punch the ceiling and all the other things that have to take place uh, when you're doing vertical ventilation. So, um, you know, it's more of an issue in my opinion with horizontal because that can happen so much faster because of you really only need a hand tool to perform horizontal ventilation versus vertical. You need all the extra equipment. So, but either way, coordinate that. Um, we know that, that, uh, Ventilated fires that aren't that, that don't have any water applied aren't going to get better. They're going to get worse. Uh, so it's just important to understand that and uh, make sure that we're coordinating things so that we're doing the best job we can. Number one, foremost for our victims, um, anybody that might be trapped inside. Um, but you know, and secondly for us, for our well-being. But I think one thing that often goes goes ends up being overlooked by a lot of firefighters because. Um, you know, some firefighters' mindsets or the way they think is um, we don't really take into consideration the amount of property damage that we're doing when we're going around breaking glass or we're breaking, breaking in doors or um, different things like that. I'm not saying don't do it. I realize there are times, there's absolutely plenty of times where it makes sense to do that. But at the same time, not everybody has insurance. Um, you know, if you live in a, a socially uh, depressed depressed or impoverished area you know a lot of people may not have insurance or if you think about going to an apartment fire um, and many of you probably know this because you've lived in an apartment at one point in your life but if you live in an apartment you're responsible for your own insurance the in, the apartment company insures the building uh, so that if the building burns down their insurance company is going to pay to have the building rebuilt they're not going to reimburse you for all your clothing and your electronics and um, everything else that gets destroyed. It's up to the individual tenants that live in those apartment buildings to have that insurance. And if somebody's living in an apartment, they may not have the financial means to, to have that renter's insurance. And then there's an apartment fire and all their stuff's lost and they are, they're up Creek without a paddle. They're, they're destitute at that point. They don't have a place to live. They don't have any clothes. Um, you know, they may have lost who knows what, if they're going to school, their laptop or whatever. So um, property damage, I think, to me, is one thing that, that we as a fire service should 
pay a little more attention to uh, when possible property conservation and the amount of damage that we do. Uh, <clears throat> but that was a little bit of a soap, <laughs> soapbox uh, lecture on my part on the on the property damage. Uh, it wasn't actually part of the original um, discussion that I was going to have tonight, but I think it's important to, to bring that up. So a little bit shorter um, podcast tonight. I want to thank you for tuning in. Um, I'm always looking for ideas for guests. I have plenty of guests that, that I, you know, that I can um, have on, but um, if you have anybody that you would like to see me interview on the show, I'm building, um, building the list for 2024 of potential guests uh, that I want to try, you know, so I want to, if the audience has people they'd like to see me interview, um, you know, we all know the big names and I'm not going to mention them. Um, those people are all great. They have a lot to offer. Uh, but I'm looking for people that maybe you know about, or you think that they have some really good thoughts on a topic or they're really well versed in, in the, uh, the way of doing something, but they may not be as well known as some of the big names that you see in the headlines all the time at the conferences or writing the articles in fire engineering magazine and things like that. So I'm always looking for suggestions for guests. Um, if you have any questions for me, uh, if you want to talk about training ideas or having me out to do any training for your organization, uh, I'm on Facebook. You can find me at Eric Dryman uh, on Facebook or the Hooks and Hoses Facebook page. Uh, check us out on Instagram. Follow us there. We try and post stuff as well on Instagram. Uh, thanks again, everybody, for listening. I uh, hope everybody has a good Halloween. Uh, we'll see you after, uh, I believe my next po podcast doesn't come out until after Thanksgiving. So everybody have a good Thanksgiving. Um, take care and, and be safe. Seconds count when responding to an emergency. Minutes save count when documenting your day. Emergency networking makes records management easier and faster with its Fire and EMS solution. User-friendly, complete online and offline functionality, highly customizable, all at an affordable price. For more information, please visit emergencynetworking.com. IFSTA is dedicated to updating firefighting techniques and safety through the creation of our manuals, apps, curriculum, resource one, and more. Our high-quality, technically accurate, and affordable training and education materials have made us a worldwide leader of the fire service. Visit us at ifsta.org for more information. Like a trusted turnout jacket you've had for years, Flex 7 Outer Shell Fabric delivers a perfectly broken-in feel on the very first wear. Flexible, comfortable, and powered with the strength of Enforce technology, Flex 7 Outer Shell Fabric is made to move. To learn more, visit tenkatafabrics.com slash flex7. Flex 7, powered by Enforce technology, only from Tenkata Protective Fabrics. Breathing in diesel exhaust fumes is like walking into a fire without a mask. Over time, those toxins lead to cancer. Protect yourself with MagnaGrip the easiest, most reliable exhaust removal system that features a true 100% seal to eliminate diesel exhaust fumes. To get free grant assistance, visit